Thank you very much to Jean-Jacques and to Anne-Marie for this invitation. I, I think it's, it's just wonderful that a big bank like this can actually... Um, put the head above the parapet and take an interest in climate change, which is so important and, and also so topical. So I've been given the task of talking a little bit about climate science. I'm a physicist, but I'll try not to make it too um, techy. See if this is not doing anything. So um, this is a graph showing um, global temperature. So it's an estimate of the average temperature over the surface of the Earth for the past 150 or so years from three independent records. And you can see it's sort of wiggling around a lot, but the overall trajectory is upwards. And this is what has become known as global warming. And we need to uh, understand why that is happening and also why it doesn't sort of occur smoothly. On that graph, you'll also see the grey shading, which, of course, is the, the uncertainty estimates around those numbers. These are very difficult to construct um, from temperature measures across the globe, so there's bound to be some uncertainty in these reconstructions. Yep. I'm having trouble with the slide changer. OK. Um, so when we talk about global warming, you sometimes um, hear people talk about one degree or two degrees warmer. And when we do that, you have to be careful uh, which baseline you're referring to. So the graph there was re rele relative to about uh, the middle of the um, 20th century. But when we talk about the Paris Agreement and things, and you hear people talking about two degrees or one and a half degrees, that's relative to the pre-industrial temperature. And you can see that's the red dashed line on the plot. Um, and we are now one degree above pre-industrial. So um, that's temperature. There are, of course, other evidence for climate change. One of the most dramatic you can see in the bottom right panel there, which is the sea level, which is just going up and up and up. Um, sea level at the moment, the main reason for it going up is to do with thermal expansion of the water. So as the water gets warmer, it just occupies more space. As we see um, ice melting, this is ice that's on land, so on the Antarctic and on Greenland, um, that will contribute also to sea level rise. On the bottom left there, you've got the Arctic sea ice, so that is not contributing to sea level, but it's just giving an indication of how warm uh, the, the summer's getting. So each year, there'll be a minimum um, Arctic sea ice extent, and you can see this minimum value is going down and down. Uh, so how can we uh, understand the physics of the Earth's climate? A very simple way to look at it is just a sort of energy balance, and there's a sun and the Earth uh, not to scale. Um, and of course, all the energy that's coming from the climate system is... Perhaps, it, can I indicate to you when I want the slides changed? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. All the energy is coming um, from the sun. Thank you. And the Earth is, is bathed in this solar radiation and absorbs the heat. And then, next slide, thank you. Um, the Earth gets hot and it gives out heat radiation. And we can do some very simple um, physics that shows that if we know how much solar radiation is coming in, then the Earth temperature would be about minus 18 Celsius. So you might think, oh, well, there's a great physicist, not very good. She's obviously got it wrong. <laughs> But of course, this is just um, a, a radiative equilibrium temperature. And if we look at the, um, uh, thank you, um, the energy budget, we have the same amount of absorbed solar radiation coming in as heat radiation going out. But there's all sorts of complex things going on within the actual atmosphere itself and the oceans. And in particular, um, you can see that of the solar radiation coming in, about half is absorbed by the surface. And the surface gets hot and it emits heat radiation, but about 90% of that, that the heat radiation is the paler color on the right, about 90% of that is actually absorbed by the atmosphere. Uh, the atmosphere itself is a material, so it gets hot, and that emits heat in all directions, in particular downwards, so then we've got more heat coming into the surface than without those gases. They become known as greenhouse gases, which is a bit of a misnomer, but we're stuck with that now. So you can see that they, the, the, this is the greenhouse effect, um, is the response to the fact 
Um, can we go back one now? Sorry. <laughs> it's a response to the fact that the atmosphere is essentially transparent to solar radiation, but is not transparent to heat radiation. So that's very simple physics. It was known for a long time, first discovered by Fourier, who of course is a famous French mathematician. So um, let's think a little bit more about the gases which are doing this. I'm um, sorry, this is a very techie diagram, but I just wanted to make two points from this picture. It's a spectrum, it's showing uh, the wavelength, so you'll be aware that uh, in terms of light, you can have colours of light going from red to blue. This is the same thing, it's wavelengths, but it's in heat radiation. And the point to be made from this plot is there are different gases absorbing at different wavelengths. And you can see that the red line there, which is representing water vapour, has the biggest effect. But we can't influence, we can't directly influence the water vapour in the atmosphere because if you put more in it just rains out again. So the most important greenhouse gas in terms of what man can do to the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. And you can see there, that's the, that's the sort of turquoise colour and um, that's doing about a third the amount of water vapour. And an interesting thing from the physics perspective, should anybody be interested, is that it just so happens that the spectral properties of that gas happen to absorb just where water vapour isn't. So it can have a, a very strong effect. So carbon dioxide is an important greenhouse gas. Now we look at the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and what I'm going to show you now is a number of graphs and they're all going to show the same thing which is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as a function of time and each graph is going to be over a longer period than the previous one. So we see the top plot on the left there is measured at uh, Hawaii so it's in clean air, it's not looking at industrial pollution. Uh, you can see the red curve with a sort of annual cycle which is reflecting the growth and decay of plants as they absorb and emit CO2, but it's an un unremitting upward trend over that 25-year um, period. 15-year period, sorry. Um, then the bottom left one is the same thing but over a longer period, 50 years, and you can see it's gone up from 1960 about 320 parts per million to uh, sort of 400, which is a sort of what we've just hit parts per million um, now. Then we've got three more graphs in the middle. Each of them is over a longer period. The plot at the top is exactly the same data as the bottom left one, but with a different vertical scale. And most of the plots I'm going to show you now have the same vertical scale going from 180 to 380. So you'll see um, that's over the past uh, 50 years. Then we've got over the past 1,000 years, and it's fairly constant at 280 until it goes up right at the end there. Then we've got over 10,000 years at the bottom there, completely flat. If we look at the top right one now, that's now going over hundreds of thousands of years. It's going up and down with the ice ages, and I'll come back to that again in a minute, but it's never gone above about 300 of these units. The next one below is uh, millions, 10 million years, 20 million years, still hasn't gone above uh, the value it is now. You have to go to a very long time ago. If you look at the bottom right panel there, which is now looking um, hundreds of millions of years into the past, and it's much, much, much higher. And then everything was different in the world then. The continents were in different places, so life on Earth was quite different. So if we could have a look at the... Thank you. Uh, the first primates on Earth didn't appear until a few, say, 60 million years ago. The first homo species not till a few million years ago. And humankind didn't appear on Earth until... <laughs> 200,000 years ago. So you see, life on Earth has not existed in the concentrations of carbon dioxide that we have at the moment. So it's, it's entirely unusual. It's also um, not natural, and we know that by, by carbon dating the carbon in, in the air, and you can look and see that it's old. It's old because it's from fossil fuels that have been burnt and put into the atmosphere. So we've got much more carbon dioxide than we've ever had before. It's very unusual. So talking about ice ages, here's a plot. The carbon dioxide one is the one I just showed you. Below is temperature over the same time. And you can see they look very similar. And you sometimes hear people say, oh, look, uh, we've had it all before. Temperature's gone up, carbon dioxide's gone up. It's all natural. Um, so what are you lot making a fuss about? Um, the issue here is that the temperature is changing um, in response to changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun. So the ellipticity of the orbit is changing. That tends to give it a bit of a warmer push. 
then that results in carbon dioxide and methane being released from natural stores on the Earth, which then makes it warmer, and you get this sort of positive effect, uh, so that the little bit of warming due to the sun is then enhanced by the, uh, the greenhouse gases. So um, it's initiated by the Earth's orbit and amplified by CO2 and methane. Um, so this is, this is perfectly natural. Uh, the two important things to note is that the CO2 is never above 300 there, and now we're at 400. And secondly, that although you couldn't see it on this graph because the temperature, the time range is so condensed, the current rate of temperature increase is about 10 times faster than that steep slope on the right. So it's unusual what we're in at the moment. I'm afraid this is a bit of a messy plot, but I wanted to show it because it's just considering um, the factors which have influenced climate change since 1750. So we have the energy balance. Anything that's going to affect the energy balance is going to affect the climate. That's the temperature record we're trying to explain. And on the right, we've got various different things that are going into the atmosphere that cause, that cause it to change. So that the nasty grey colour is the carbon dioxide. Then you've got other greenhouse gases adding on top. You've got a tiny little yellow wiggle on the top there, which is changes in the sun. And then you've got a few factors that are causing it to cool, which are generally particulates getting up into the atmosphere from industry and also from land use changes and agricultural practices, which reflect sunshine back to space, so actually cooling the planet. And then you've got these spikes, which are volcanoes. So um, a volcano has put stuff into the atmosphere and, and reflect the sunshine to space as well. So that's perfectly natural, of course. So um, when we try and explain that wiggly temperature record, bottom left down there, of course, we need to take all of these components, the natural components and the human components, into account. And this is what we do. Oh, plot on the left's gone a bit funny. Um, what we've got here is two curves. Um, both are showing the same thing, which is the black curve, is the temperature change I've shown you before, temperature change over time, over 100 and so years. The coloured curves are estimates using computer models. So these are the same models that are used to predict the weather on a on, you know, daily basis, but we run them over a much longer period to look at uh, climate change. And the, the little, each of the individual spaghetti uh, curve is a different model simulation. So on the bottom left, we have only the natural forcing, which is the sun and the volcanoes. And you can see that by the time you get to about 1970, there's a divergence between the observations and the models. On the right, we've got all the forcings in, and you can't explain that recent warming without including the greenhouse gases. Another important point to make about this plot is um, there's lots of different spaghettis because you start at a particular point and then you watch the climate evolve. And if you make a small uh, difference in the initial conditions, it will evolve in a slightly different way. So that's, that's the, uh, the spread around the mean of all those variables. But you see there's an envelope which is following up the observations. And another point to make is that, of course, the Earth is not an average. It's one realisation. It's one of those spaghettis, or perhaps none of those spaghettis, but it's doing a wiggle. So it's not surprising that it's wiggling. It's just a, a very complex um, situation, that, that uh, natural environment. Now, we talk about global warming, but of course it's not the same all over the globe, and in fact it's, it's very variable. You can see the places that have been warmed the most are continent, mainly continental areas, and there's some places that have warmed hardly at all, and indeed it looks like the North Atlantic has possibly even been cooling slightly, or certainly not warming very much. And that's a very interesting challenge to explain that for the climate scientists, and we think it's something to do with changes in the ocean circulation. So you can see over, overall, we have much larger warming in some places, over two degrees over continental Asia and South America, and less in other places. So the impacts will be different across the world too. Thank you. So if we're going to try and predict what happens in the future, of course we have to um, predict what the CO2 is going to be like. And this means predicting the economy and energy use, which is impossible for me and I think probably more difficult than predicting the climate. And so there's various different um, what are called uh, representative pathways that are, are, are used to look at different, re, uh, different scenarios. And the bottom uh, on the left there is um, looking at these different scenarios in terms of the components of the energy use. So black is coal and orange is oil, etc. And there's these four different scenarios. 
And the two graphs then are CO2 emissions, so if you use those energy pathways, what emissions do you get as a function of time? And then the right-hand panel is the concentrations. And the emissions and the concentrations don't give the same graph because the uh, carbon dioxide is very, has a very long lifetime. Once you've got it in the air, it'll stay there about 200 years. So with that blue curve, which is the worst one, it's sort of flattening off by about 2100, but the concentrations are still shooting upwards because it's, not, it's, not, um, it, it's just up there and it's staying up there. So even if you uh, get the green one, which is the best one, and it, you've got emissions going to net zero by 2080, you still haven't got back to current day CO2 concentrations by the end of the century. So this is um, the future of the surf global surface temperature under the worst and the best scenarios there. This again is relative to um, just about 2,000, so you have to add on about a half a degree to, um, to that to get the relative to pre-industrial. And you can see with the, um, the better of the, of, the law, of the ones, it's going to be about um, one and a half or two degrees. And with the worst, it's now up about five degrees global warming, which is really severe. This is a very important point. I've written it in text <laughs> to make the point more strongly. If you carry on adding CO2 to the atmosphere, the Earth will carry on warming. That's just the state of the things. If you want to stop the world warming, you've got to stop emitting CO2. Absolutely stop it. You can't just say, I'm going to do less. So, um, of course, stopping it completely is going to be quite difficult. So um, we refer to net emissions. So there's going to have to be some technologies developed which will uh, suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere or put it somewhere so that um, the, the uh, uses which we can't avoid, maybe uh, perhaps um, fuels or, or other things, are still going to need to put CO2 into the atmosphere, are balanced in some way or other. That's an absolute uh, fundamental point. Thank you. Uh, this is predicted um, sea level rise, and again, you'll note there's a lagged response to the CO2. Um, this is predicted uh, change um, for the two scenarios, low scenario on the left, the higher scenario on the right, of temperature at the top and precipitation at the bottom. It's very difficult for the climate models to be, to be details in precipitation, rain and snowfall. But you can see there's a suggestion that the monsoons are going to get wetter and uh, especially the southern Mediterranean is and North Africa is going to be much drier, for example. And again, the temperature distribution over the globe is going to be... Um, thanks, she's given me a five-minute warning. Um, this was just examples of the sort of things that the emissions pathways could end up uh, in terms of impact. I'm not going to go through that. There's some pretty disastrous scenarios. Can I skip that? Um, so we've, we've had the, the, the COP meeting in Paris, which was absolutely fantastic. It was wonderful. It was such exciting time um, and such a success. It was just not what we, what I was expecting at all to happen. And we got the agreement that we were going to try and keep global temperatures to well below two degrees. And the countries all committing um, themselves to particular reductions in CO2 emissions. That was absolutely marvellous, the fact that any agreement was reached. And even the fact that, uh, that the 1.5 degrees was mentioned is just a huge success. Now, of course, we have to do it. Um, and this is now the challenge. And what we've got on this graph here is essentially um, the, the blue thing at the top there is the, the temperature, sorry, the CO2 emission scenario with um, current carrying on as current. And the pink one is carrying on with the promised emissions reduction. So it, it's very good, but it's not enough. Um, and we need to get them much lower. Just um, So this is um, investment in clean energy. So clearly we're going to need some lots more clean and renewable energy. And this mission innovation is an agreement with several countries um, having committed to doubling their investment in, in clean energy. Thank you. Uh, then we got this, of course. Um, um, he wants to renegotiate the deal, which is a somewhat ignorant thing to say because you can't, you can't renegotiate a voluntary agreement. I mean, you know, he can just not do it. That's probably what he plans to do. It's a serious, serious situation, of course. Um, perhaps I'll just stop there. I've got other things to say, but I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions. <laughs>